morning, Johanna. Thank you for accepting the invitation uh, for being part of Beans Talk series. Today we are going to talk about cultural diplomacy and creative economy, a very interesting subject. Before we move ahead, uh, I would like to introduce uh, Johanna. Johanna, in fact, I should say that you have a very difficult name as far <laughs> for the people from this part of the country. I'll try to spell it right. Johanna Kusmain Karawayev. If I, I'm okay with your name, how we are pronounced? It's perfect. It's perfect. <laughs> okay. That's, thank you so much. <laughs> Johanna is a consultant, a researcher, and a cultural strategist with 20 years of experience from the culture and creative sectors. She's the managing director of IFA Laboratory, focusing on cultural strategy, culture in the context of international relations and cooperation, transfer of skills and perspectives from creative sectors to business and industry, creative economy development and innovation. More than that, she is our country chair for Belgium G100 Arts Leadership Council. Now today, nowadays we keep hearing about uh, cultural diplomacy and uh, creative economy. Cultural diplomacy, yes, I believe that relationship between the countries, I think, or if you say culture is the key point to bind to countries, bind to people, that is the way of, you know, peace. So I believe it is an important role which we are going down. People are talking more about it. We are giving importance to it. I believe that a peace or the binding force between the nations is very, very important during these times which we are passing through. Uh, I would like to say she wrote a master thesis called Cultural Diplomacy, an exercise for the tightrope artist, politically motivated image building cultural capacity building or creating a better world. Hmm. Cultural diplomacy exchanges of ideas, informations, art, language, and other aspects of culture among nations and their people in order to foster mutual understanding. That's why I said it is so important. It's very important to address this and look into it in a wider perspective. Johanna, I just want to know how cultural diplomacy is relevant today's in international, today's international relationship. It was there always, but today how it is more relevant. Uh, thank you, Bina, for, for that question. And thank you so much for inviting me to your talk. Um, and also to the context of, of art leadership wing for G100. Um, I am delighted to, to be a part of that. Um, so first, maybe I, I could say something about the term um, culture diplomacy. I think, first of all, it's something that we hear so much talked about today. And I know that, you know, people think about various different things when they think about the here culture diplomacy, of course, depending on who you're talking to. Um, if you're looking a bit from um, a scholar's or academic's view on this word, it is clearly a government to government uh, practice, you know, a government and a government trying to impact a gov another government or uh, a population of another country. And the practice of culture diplomacy in that context is often related to showcasing, it's showcasing nature, it's about standing out, it's about showing that you are very great and very attractive through culture and of course it can be also about impacting on, on, on political areas and processes but this kind of culture diplomacy um, depending on now if you're talking to specialists uh, in culture and in the national context I think that this is um, um, fading kind of practice and for sure when you mention people to people practice I think that is what really matters and that it was that is also what really matters if you're talking about countries and governments that have complicated relations um, and where you have uh, also the um, opposite of course to democracies uh, people to people relations are uh, very very important so I I would say that when I talk about culture diplomacy, I talk about, I talk first, I think more culture in the context of international relations and more than about culture relations, maybe international culture relations. 
um, which is much more about, you know, people for people practice. There can be different institutions, governmental actors can possibly be involved. That is not an issue, but it's not them who run the agenda who tries to uh, push through specific topics or um, issues that they want to put forward or that they want to stand out for. Um, so, of course, culture in the international context, as you said, it's so important. Culture is what we are. I mean, in the wider sense, it's about identity. It's something that can bring us together and equally set us apart. So extremely important to have the cultural awareness in um, international relations. And uh, of course, it's a question of, 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 of how you act, what you do, and why you are doing what you're doing in, in culture and international relations. Um, there is an international relations specialist called Simon Anhalt, who I also mentioned a quote in my thesis. And, you know, he states that um, a country cannot actually change or ameliorate um, one's image by only communicating on, you know, things that they do well or, you know, that they um, stand out for. The only way that you can actually um, impact the image of your country or, or now what it is you want to change is by actually engaging in multilateral and international collaboration. So I have a very similar standpoint on how you act in culture. For me, it's a lot about, if it's not about capacity building, which is of course about creating interesting context for the practitioners within the culture and creative industries, it can of course be about um, caring about the world we are living in and to try to, you know, um, create better context about creating, trying to find universal solutions on universal problems. And that is a lot what I wrote about actually in the thesis um, last year. Yeah, yeah it's, it's actually a, a very important thing when it becomes of a culture of a society. Uh, I think any culture, in, when it comes to any countries, we basically, if you see the the core values are similar, must be you know uh, the way it has been represented, maybe uh, you know in different ways, but the core values is togetherness, peace, and you know uh, that is what the core values. And think, yeah. and I think it can it can make a, a real difference when it comes to any type of relationships, whether it is a relationship between an office or people among an office, yes. uh, however, however bigger the, you know, even in a, in a home as such, such activities is what is going to bind uh, people. That's yes. what I think. Johanna, you have done in 2020, Johanna, you have co-founded Artisans of Innovations, which is very interesting name, where she, you are the principal consultant in culture and creative specializing on cross-sector ecosystem development and cross-sector collaboration. I just want to know, what is your idea behind artisans of innovations? Because you have beautiful words like ecosystem development and, you know, yeah. cross like we just spoke about cross-sector. I think you may have much more to say. I just want to know what is your idea or what is your thought process behind mm. this uh, in uh, this Sure. So first of all, um, the, the three of us who founded Artisans of Innovation, Peter Raj and Kawar Hamid, they are both, we are the three of us in different disciplines. Kawar Hamid is in digital innovation and Peter Raj, well, he's in culture, creative economy, but he's more in, well, both film industry, but also culture and creative cluster development. So we are quite complementary to one another. And the complementarity is the whole philosophy and idea behind Artisans of Innovation, which I call a innovation consultancy partnership that can grow and also has partly, I will come back to that, um, in, you know, in terms of what kind of expertise is brought in. And of course, that is the whole idea is the cross-sector collaboration. But, and in relation to culture and creative industries, I guess that our idea is to really place these at the heart of 
the economy as a driver in the post-COVID economy and also uh, in the fourth industrial revolution, which is something that we hear also a lot uh, to talk about today. And I feel that the cross-sector collaboration and the ecosystem development, well, you know, I think it's that is a lot about creating um, the knowledge is there within a country, within an entity, uh, within a company. The problem is when the knowledge is not connected. What happens when you connect knowledge? So, for example, um, in, in outside, like culture and creative operators working outside the, the fields of, you know, their direct practice. So for me, at, at the essence of this, it comes down to the skills and the perspectives of different uh, of the culture and creative sectors. And specifically, I talk about art and design professions, the skills and the creative process that is so central in the artistic and design professions. And, you know, the, in the fourth industrial revolution and in the post, I mean, the knowledge economy, um, like skills, for example, you know, com complex problem solving, critical thinking, <clears throat> Creativity, of course, is something that you always hear and that people also often relate to the culture and creative industries. But then uh, the, uh, the uh, experimental ability and the mindset, the creation process and the, yeah, the open mindset, basically, the, these are outspokenly needed uh, by other sectors than the culture and creative sectors. And there is in, in, in putting these sectors or creative culture sectors in collaboration with other sectors, it's a huge human um, centric innovation potential there because of course all types of innovation is driven by the human, uh, the human aspect of innovation. There are people behind all this innovation. The problem um, I think is that that is also something that I come back to, but um, we found out a lot about in our re applied research that we are doing also as a part of AOI, Artisans of Innovation. There are profound um, belief, different belief systems within, I mean, first culture and creative sectors on one side and business industry and other sectors on another side. This is based on different values of different ways of seeing the world, contributing to the world, economic interest, um, you know, what do we innovate for? Do we innovate for doing an artwork sublime? Or are we innovating to actually earn more money? What is the drive behind all of that? So there is really important work to be done between the sectors and that we are doing, you know, in different ways for artisans of innovation. I mean, just to take an example, last year we did a um, webinar for um, European Union uh, Association of Development Agencies with development agencies across Europe, where we talked about that, about what we think is the potential of the culture and creative and digital sectors in, in post-COVID innovation. Um, but yes, so also to, to say something about um, further about that. So it's, it's this kind of collaboration enables different and new business models. Um, I think it's a possibility to create new labor markets, definitely for artists and design professionals. Um, it's actually an impossibility that all the artists that are so important, the creativity and the artistic practice. But we all know that the sectors have, I mean, we have seen that even more during the COVID as well, um, very severely impacted sectors that are already, uh, you know, fragile because of all the independent practice and unpaid practice and low, uh, lower pay, uh, pay scales and so on. So this, they really, the kind of practice where you enable and professionalize and help artists to understand and design professionals understand how they can be useful in other sectors would actually create another kind of, 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 of uh, uh, employment and mission possibility income bringing uh, source. 
um, that is actually related to skills um, that artists and design professionals have. Um, they would not need to work in, in underpaid and underskilled jobs where, I mean, myself, I was trained as an actor a long time ago. And uh, of course I have had my, my fair share of, of underpaid cafe jobs. And, you know, I guess that many artists know that those kind of contexts. So how can you actually, um, you know, um, bring more knowledge both to the culture and creative sectors on the skills that are actually there and then translate that and create the awareness around this uh, in the corporate sectors and industry and business sectors. And for the business sector, that kind of, of, of collaboration can bring enormously, you know, uh, it can have positive effects for productivity, communication. Uh, and uh, I think culture and creative uh, and artists and designers can be very good at identification of, of different kinds of issues that are going on within a project, a company, uh, a specific context. And I think it gives more possibility to see things from a closer, at least, to a 360 degree perspective, which is so important. Innovation can only happen in diversity, um, being confronted to very different views and ways of, 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 of seeing uh, things. So um, an enormous potential there, really. And I think that there is no um, there is no miracle with this kind of practice. There is a lot of hard work in order to make this go forward. There is a lot of facilitation to be done. Um, there are lot, still a lot of good examples on both micro and macro level practices, you know, between companies and artists, one artist and a group of artists, and also then on more sector representation level how these people can interact. And it's very important as well to create thorough and high level networks of ambassadors to do understand this practice, what is behind and what is needed in an ecosystem uh, around this kind of practice, both on educational level, for professional levels, for policy levels and so on. So this is an area then that we, we, we have been doing uh, applied research on within Artisans of Innovation and bringing in, for example, then uh, again, the Innovation Consultancy Partnership. There's also a lady from South Africa, Zelda Skrama, who started to, to, who we are doing this research with. Um, she's, for example, an innovation, uh, corporate innovation specialist. And it's very, very interesting. All, I mean, it's worthless. Each, each of every one of us, of course, is worthless if it's not together to have this larger perspective. It's really what is, what is very interesting. That's beautiful that, in fact, uh, that's the truth, you know. Uh, as a team, we achieve more uh, than, you know, single person. I just want to know a little more on that particular question. So you mean artisans of innovation is basically a bridge or a facilitator for artisans and even to corporates to that merge the skills of uh, an artisan or, or basically as, as an independent artist, uh, the realm of uh, earning becomes very restricted. Uh, so you basically, you are as a company, uh, you help them out to have a merger uh, not, or, a not, or is no. it only, or, or only on imparting knowledge or, yeah. you know, yeah, or is it, uh, on what so, way you take it forward? Sure. We, we are not, we are not, um, turning to artists, um, there are, um, of course, there are many, you know, culture brokers and there are many, many, there are organizations around the world that are working directly with artists. Um, but I would say that there is actually a problem in that, you know, how do you work directly also with the artist with this? Because the problem is that none of these skill and perspective transfer questions are addressed in art education right so how do artists even start thinking about that they could possibly do this and work with this some artists have some artists are of course as we know 
entrepreneurs have their own companies and have a lot of themselves um, interesting relationship, maybe also privately with other sectors, family members and friends. And they have a curiosity leading them to, to, to explore this, these areas themselves. And it would be actually very interesting to see how, you know, artists working with this already worldwide with providing their skills and perspectives to the corporate sector, how they actually came to the conclusion that they were going to do that. Um, but of course, in the research that we have been doing, there's one part of the research uh, that is interviews with um, culture and creative professionals, and one part which is interviews with corporate professionals. And of course, from our side, for the artists, but there are artists, researchers, creative economy experts, different kind of people, but people who already have this overview. But then again, that is rare. It's rare with these people who, who have a thorough experience because also, of course, as an artist, it's important to understand, you know, what you are actually contributing with and what you can do in that environment. So anyway, it is a it is something that should be professionalized. But our main role with Artisans of Innovation is not that. It is really enabling the ecosystem development. And I would say then from a public authority level, from a governmental level, um, to make them um, more or open up their eyes more about what is possible and how that could be done. Because again, everything is there almost in any place or any country in the world, the knowledge is there. It's rarely you have to provide knowledge from the outside if it's not something very, very specific, right? Um, that has been by certain reasons developed in a specific part of the world or in a specific country. It's about going in and facilitating that, to have already that view and facilitating how all of that goes together. So. It's more of an implementation, you know, like knowledge is there, informations are there, but yeah. the time it is implemented and, you know, uh, it's not going to have a value for it. In your, uh, I have just uh, uh, in your profile or what when we have spoken a little later, you said about this cross-sector partnership. Yeah. You know, second, when you're talking about all these things, will it really support the traditional sector? Yes. Uh, will it, yes, will it, yes. Uh, yeah. Of course, of course. So again, then, I mean, diversity of thought and, you know, is, is something that the, the cross-sector partnerships bring to the table. Diversity of thoughts then is something that enables innovation. Um, you know, I think that uh, I mentioned that Co like traditional sectors or the co corporates or industry or, or, or they they often connect creativity to the culture and creative sectors but really this goes so much far beyond that it is from a, a more global way it is really about the doing and seeing differently it's about making, creating a fuller picture of issues, problems and projects and structures, as I said earlier. But there are actually like very, depending on what kind of context, because there's never anything general, you always have to work in very precise context. So for example, you know, do we want to increase employee participation? Do we want to improve leadership skills? Do we want to facilitate or, or do we have communication issues? Do we need to be better at external communication? Do we need to develop new ideas? Um, what is our organizational capacity for innovation? Um, there are, uh, or, or for example, uh, something that I, <clears throat> um, that I, we, before, because also with my company, IFA Laboratory, we have been working with this on a B2B, basis. Um, however, I abandoned that a bit uh, for a while to actively look up clients because I felt that there is a whole lot of a deal of work that still is needed in order to raise the awareness of this kind of practice. So that is thus went back to research and thus also, you know, artisans of innovation and my motivation to, to create that, that kind of, pro of, of practice or, or, or collaboration. 
but basically you know artists can are very good at seeing things and identifying things and if it comes to for example such a um, basic thing as company values you know how how can artists in different ways help you to concretize concretize them you know to see them i mean maybe visual artists can help to visualize these values in different way um performing artists can help you to really feel them and embody them and how do you actually live your company values um, as you know whatever now role you do have in a entity in a company and uh, then also for example we had a, an orchestra director who can help you know with the metaphors being between being uh, orchestra director and his orchestra being the CEO or a manager or a manager for a team like how do you delegate through those values how do you work with your teams so how do you transmit so you know um, I guess that there are different artistic disciplines that can be more or less suitable in different contexts for different issues um, but again and then it's also more freer innovation it's all a question about what do you let an artist do in a specific context you know how what kind of rules do you actually set up but i mean this what an ideal context is like that we could go on talking a lot about and much longer than i think that we have today that's a completely other than we have to go in depth and talk about that yeah. um but there is far much beyond creativity and the understanding of creativity that artists and designers can give to companies yeah if we then again look at the single route because it should not be a single route ideally of course there has to be a give and take between all sectors between corporate sectors and culture and creative sectors and there are many possibilities yeah actually the subject is actually has to be broken down into few sections you know to have more clarity that is what i i feel in the what you're saying about yes uh even un this year to 2021 yeah, as in uh, as announced as an international year for creative economy for sustainable development yes and i've seen that you write a series of articles for diplomatic world magazine on this theme innovate uh cultural diplomacy I think we have also almost answered the question, uh, but still I just want to know what makes up a creative economy. When you say about creative economy uh, uh, for a person, it's basically money created out of some creative action, you know. So when it comes to economy as such, when we say that art being a part of creative economy, so then there are a lot of restrictions in the thoughts. Just want to have a small feel about it or small uh, uh, intro on what makes up actually a creative economy yeah. and why it is so important. Yeah, okay. Well, um, there is actually no universal agreement on what is exactly creative economy because different uh, governments and countries and international bodies they do have a bit different definitions of what is creative economy but maybe to uh, go for like the easy answer one could say that it is creative economy is made up by all professions and sectors within the culture and creative industries but it can also include um, creative professions that are happening in so to speak less or traditionally less creative sectors for example an art designer or a graphic designer working in a bank or in an insurance company so that's a very you know and and then depending on ways of measuring um the creative economy that is taken into account or not um so you know beyond the fact that uh, these sectors are really growing that is something that you see worldwide this sector is something there are something they are creating a lot of employment yeah. um and uh, you can uh, you know it, and that is definitely globally you know that you you can see for example that uh, why they have been important and why they are important during the covid crisis you can see all that culture and creative professionals 
have done for the well-being of people really in order to make people endure and even maybe survive in certain cases very rough context so you know people are listening to their music they're looking at their paintings they're reading their books they're listening to operas etc etc and I do hope in some sense that also this period has also made people open up their eyes a bit more for that. But also, you know, the creative economy is uh, definitely interesting in the view of economic diversification. There are some many countries in the world that are also still dependent on, you know, their natural resources. Think about the oil states, for example. Um, they realized that that will come to an end for them as well at some point. So what do they do? It's definitely uh, in the interest to look at how do we diversify our economy? And, uh, you know, as also other things, it's not only about the creative economy, but the creative economy, again, it has a lot of innovation potential and beyond then, of course, the intrinsic value and in some way instrumental value I mean if we think about like the well-being it gives also but that's also maybe intrinsic value it gives to 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 everyone not only to their professionals so yeah and we have already discussed about the skills uh, and and that these these that these sectors have in so high concentration so I think that that already says a lot about why it's important yeah, yes, of course, it's important because recently I was going through uh, uh, the, you know, uh, GDP uh, contribution based out of US uh, and I've realized one of the major contribution to US economies through creative economy. Actually, it was yeah. an alarming thought in my mind saying that, you know, so I was in fact in my other organization called Wiki. And we are literally concentrating on this, uh, going to the villages, trying to bring in the craft, dyeing arts, uh, you know, uh, which can be a sustainable uh, living for the people around. And, you know, you are doing something you always love to do, you know, uh, creativity, something like that. Yes. So we are literally working on ground to bring in uh, a lot of works like that uh, to the in to the villages and uh, uh, going back to roots because people leave uh, villages and people leave small towns, go to the metros in search of uh, uh, living because they really don't have a sustainable uh, living with their crafts or with their you know what they were practicing. But that actually gives a very uh, very strong. Uh, if we really concentrate on it, that can really play a big part in in uh, leave uh, the economy part in even their own uh, economy of their personal economy also. Uh, so I believe that, okay, uh, I just want to know you also, I think, agree with me that uh, uh, the cultural diplomacy or whatever you are doing now and this di- diversity to contribute, is it's actually is going to contribute sustainable, sustainable development. That is what I think. I think you, you will agree. Yes. Yes, because I think that a lot of the articles uh, or the articles that I write this year um, that you mentioned and also what I wrote in my thesis last year, you know, it's it's about creating more awareness on how actually on how you work with culture in international relations. And, you know, as we said, going beyond, you know, the traditional way of doing culture diplomacy and how do you, beyond capacity building and creating opportunities for your culture and creative professionals within your country, how do you, how do you actually go out there and do something in collaboration and try to create a better world, you know, go, going beyond again this look at us and how great we are kind of practice. So, yes, um, culture in the context of international relation can do a lot. You know, artists are already, many artists are doing a lot uh, to in the, on, on topics like poverty and environment and stigmatization and dictatorship and freedom of expression and a lot of different things. So for sure, um, culture, you know, also culture, it's a huge debate whether culture should be the fourth pillar of sustainable development and and uh, and also you know h- how culture can actually concretely contribute to the sustainable development goals there are there of course it's uh, 
it, I think it, it culture should probably be a fourth pillar because it's so essential. It's so um, amidst us all as economy, you know? Yeah, Why would it be any difference really, you know? Yes, yes. Uh, and the, the World Economic Forum sites that, you know, McKin McKinsey Global Institute's report, skill shift automation and the future of the workforce. The report places works uh, skills into five distinct categories, physical and manual, uh, or basic cognitive, higher cognitive, social and emotional, and technological. Demand for higher cognitive skills, such as creativity, critical thinking, and decision making, and complex information processing, actually will go through 2030 at cumulative double digit rates. That's what the report says. It's very beautiful and interesting to hear such reports um, because I, I, I too believe the same, you know, on a personal level. Uh, but when it is going to get a space, you know, it's really interesting. Uh, and you have been doing your pilot research uh, with your colleague at AOI about the basic need, need of a model giving, overweighing the understanding and process and opportunities of artistic intervention and artists in corporate mm -hmm. contests. You are given an like you know uh, a brief intro in our initial answers, but I just want to know uh, like on a personal level or on a company level how we can you know even as a G hundred women we are part of organization how we we can collaborate or how we can do this on a larger level you know uh, as you said earlier the team is what is going to make the difference but uh, I feel it has to be put into people's. Uh, uh, the corporate's head, the importance of all these things. Yes, it is changing. Um, I think even uh, the way of you selecting a person has changed how it was 10 years back and now. Now people look at, you know, uh, not only the uh, educational qualification, they look at, uh, I uh, look at the, you know, talent of a person because I, I believe if you are uh, basically an, an artist, they have the tendency of taking the roots which they are, not uh, you know used of taking they are able to have a visualize able to, the pers the perception changes from others and able to take a risk you know all these things makes it's part of being an artist this being an artist also i believe in my own business my own work mm -hmm. i believe that so as an organization as a person johanna how this can be you know implemented and how we can you know uh, make this as a but it must be in other part of the world. You must be talking more on cultural diplomacy and all this. But I think in my part of the world, or we have we talk less about this. So I believe that you know, as an organization or as persons, we can develop this. And how do you think about this particular point? Than just being in reports, you know? Yeah, you know, there's uh, what I realize with the the, the research that we are doing is that, you know, as I have already mentioned, the, the enormous uh, difference in, 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 in belief systems and, you know, the way that you look upon things and the world and why you're doing what you're doing uh, and how enormously a lot of bridge need building that is needed and facilitation, culture brokering, it is a very important profession now already, you know, <laughs> we should need that, you know, now we will have that in the future, I am sure, because I think that slowly but surely the world will understand that we cannot work in silos and there has to be structured ways of, of getting there, obviously. So, for example, you know, culture management education um, but it's not only about culture management education, it's also about the artist, you know, artistic education and training. And it's also about the business education and training on how do we collaborate with one another and how do we discover these uh, intersectional uh, practices. But, you know, I think that it is really necessary in order to get further with this kinds of models of, of ideal interactions and so on, both on micro and macro levels. It's important to analyze all the cultural brokering that is already happening out there. In some way, it is what we are doing also now with Art Sense of Innovation. 
But I feel that um, the models of intervention, um, let's say, you know, that, um, I mean, very concrete, like an artist is coming to a company and will explain what he and she can do and why and how that will impact something, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. He or she coming there is already a big thing. It is everything that has to happen before. It's all the language that this person has to have before getting there in order to convince the company. And, um, you know, so it's a language issue there and it's a professionalization issue there. Um, and yeah, the, these, these, are, these are extremely important, important parts to, to, to look at. But I would say also then related to that, the networks of, you know, to raise the awareness around the potential of the practice to really, I mean, what I see also with our network, you know, the, the what we can do together in order to um, raise awareness in our circles, you know, and how we can talk about it and how we can create possible even workshops. It's, it's about being, choosing the concrete uh, context, you know, the right concrete context in, in each and every different context. So everything has to be adapted, of course, and depending again, are we talking really about a concrete scenario of interaction between an artist and, 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 and any kind of entity, or are we talking about a uh, more uh, political policy level? Are we talking more about uh, representation level of the sectors? Are we talking about education or what are we talking about? But yes, the so uh, before the model stage, the awareness raising um, extremely important. And uh, I believe that uh, even it should be part of our education system too. Yes, yes, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, because. Uh, uh, in in us uh, in uh, like in India as such, art education is there, but uh, it's just um, it just remains on the books or you know uh, the child is not uh, given that uh, core strength, saying that art can also be a part of living. Yeah, you are forcing the child to take such knowledges or take uh, you learn such things. If somebody is just painting and don't waste your time painting, you know, you know, to go and study. I'm just telling you a similar, uh, a small phrase, which is available around. Yes, things are changes changing now, but I feel it has to be a very strong uh, part of our education. Yes. Because, yes. you know, that, that, and before making model, as you said, awareness can be through education and awareness to the corporates. Yes. How, you yes. know, if such things has to happen if this has to be implemented. Absolutely. And, and we actually need, you know, the question is how on educational level is this made in the easiest way? Because look at, for example, um, you know, um, the siloed systems we have. So you're looking at professors who are used to do things as they have always been used to do things. And I know that we will maybe um, take that, um, uh, talk about that, come back to that later, but you know, the, the introspection that is actually needed also from the culture and creative and art sectors yes. to, see, to see beyond that, okay, yes, arts creation, it is about arts creation, right? That is why I'm interested in being an artist, but you can actually be driven being an artist in another way as well, to tell stories, to impact people, to reflect life, to reflect problems. And arts practice is such a strong medium because it can really reach people's hearts and feelings. And that's where you change people. That is when you impact really people. And uh, that's why, I mean, it's an extremely important uh, medium in that sense. So, yes, I think it should be natural to also think about, you know, how, so if you talk so much negatively about instrumentalization, but how do you instrumentalize something with a positive um, in intention, you know? So, so it's basically we are saying the role of the creative industries, particularly art and the design professionals as drivers of innovations in other economic sectors, such as industries and services, 
which will have direct and indirect effects on the economy. That's what exactly you are saying. It is going to be like that. And um, yeah, I, I actually, it's it's a beautiful for me. It's like a beautiful two strong pillars. Uh, one is uh, I know the strength of an artist that can bring in uh, to a corporate sector, uh, but bridging them, you know, that is what we are discussing about. Also, that is what is the real. I think inputs or the awareness has to be done. There has to be some hand holding sections to make it happen uh, yeah. and you know, on ground so that it becomes a practice. It becomes a practice. Yeah. What do you think the role and the value of culture and creative industries or how it has happened during the pandemic? We are mentions in between your talk and how it is going to have an effect after COVID-19 pandemic. Because COVID-19 pandemic was an era of change, mm. of human values, thought process. And I really believe that even art also has an, going to have an important impact. Uh, you know, uh, yes, people are suffering all that stories apart, but then uh, there is a very brighter side uh, which I feel where people will realize. And how do you think about that? Well, first of all, like uh, thinking about like the role that the sectors have and should have um, during and post. Well, during in some way from one perspective, from one perspective, it should only be about surviving, right? It's uh, the sectors have been very badly affected. So, the problem is that I think that, um, and that is something that I wrote about as well in an article, that it's natural that you look at like how to build back, how to reestablish, how to, you know, um, get to, 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 you know, to be able to recuperate all the loss and economic loss that professionals and entities within the culture and creative sector has uh, sectors have suffered but there is something that is not looked at in that in doing so and in focusing on that it's about the longer term impact because any crisis in the world will always have a negative impact on people so of course there has to be always some some rescue rescuing being done but how do we actually look at how you know how to do things in a new way and on the long run and on this new world and, and that we are trying to adapt to. So, you know, that is, I hope that there is maybe that the COVID-19 situation um, possibly facilitates a bit this kind of practice that we have been discussing between the sectors and how artists and design professionals can, the roles that they can have. Because we have all realized that change and brutal change and doing things in ways that we are not used to do, we have all need to face in this crisis. So maybe this has opened up another kind of open-mindedness to, to this kind of, of practice. So one thing is actually just, you know, how, how do we let it happen? I had a discussion with someone uh, in the corporate interviews and, you know, he said that, you know, change in companies is never an easy thing. And it's not the question of if it's an artist providing or trying to help out with that. It's anyone who is trying to provide that help it's not an easy exercise so also taking that into mind you know so anyway i do hope that the covid 19 situation has in some way facilitated uh, facilitates eases up a bit for this kind of practice that we discussed yeah yeah it has become people have realized uh, it plays a major role in the case of mental health uh, yeah, uh, that is what is supported a lot of people to cross over the uh, issues which we all uh, faced in different levels. I believe that there has to be a change in thoughts, but I always understand or, or in as per my experience, 
or me being an artist i always believe artists are the one you know the first person to come out of a cocoon okay uh, i feel an artist community should be prepared for this innovative methods because this is how i do and this is how i am going to do that has to be changed if you want to move ahead with life or move ahead with more innovative methods that has to be changed than just using the traditional artist just being a traditional artist uh, and to embrace these changes and how do you think that you know we can do that particular part of uh, working with an artist community uh, to do this yes so i think that of course if it's um, you know in an artist community it can be in any artist association you know to open up a reflection about that you know what, what is the driving force in art creation and uh, you know relating that to 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 current world issues basically because you know in in education i i had a a, a talk at the uh, Brussels, the Academy of Fine Arts in Brussels some years ago. And I remember that um, I think my session was called um, A Life in Art, What Strategy? And I talked a lot about, uh, well, the kind of practice that we have been talking about and also about, of course, entrepreneurial upskilling and digital upskilling already, which are so important for artists. Um, and it was in that sense, it was really, you know, sad to see that they had never heard this kind of discourse before. They had never, you know, no one uh, in during their education time had ever talked about these kinds of things. I guess that in many art training programs and in higher arts education, there is a certain emphasis on self-promotion and marketing. There are certainly probably some entrepreneurial aspects, but again, that is not evident either. So I think that, you know, um, to talk about, um, to, to also to think about, you know, are, are the art sectors and the culture sectors enough valorized? If they are not, how can we valorize them? How can we contribute to that is happening? And I do believe that, um, you know, if you're not sensibilized for the intrinsic value of the arts, if you, um, if someone is not convinced in the arts for such a value, for that intrinsic value, the persons, it's much more possible that they will be sensibilized to the instrumental or the economic values of culture. So I just think we have to realize that we cannot be um, egoistic anymore just in our practice and think about all the beautiful things and you know that I want to create or maybe you can but of course it's of course you can I mean everyone has the freedom to do what they want but I think it would be sensible in regards to what we're talking about today to 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 ab absolutely try to open up that discussion and and then of course it's a question of is, is this just in a association in a community or if it's in art training programs and the question is what kind of programs should there be experimental plug-in programs or specific projects or you know should there be new bachelors and MAs invented or you know there are different yeah I understand because it is options. very important to bring uh, that into education uh, new uh, new uh, methods has to be innovated and uh, Johanna you actually as working on a very important uh, subject you know uh, whether it is diplomacy or whether it is innovation or whether it is binding you know or doing that bridging process it is not it sounds so beautiful but I know it is not going to be very easy but uh, people like you is going to make a lot of change in these thoughts also there are a lot of places knowingly, unknowingly, we are all doing this, but it has to come, as you said, the word economy has to come in there. So then only we'll realize that exchange, what is exactly happening, how much it can be rewarding. I think this is going to be a huge subject. I need to, uh, I need to call you for another uh, talk, uh, dividing these subjects 
into uh, separate uh, sessions to understand more about what you are doing. And uh, this, we just got a basic gist about you know, the whole thing as such, as a subject as such. But as a person on what ground we are doing, uh, we will also think to my, uh, we will also think in our uh, uh, our G hundred uh, group uh, how this can be implemented, how this can become a force uh, from our end. It was so wonderful talking about uh, uh, both. I also have got a lot of clarity based personally uh, because I am an artist and an an entrepreneur yeah. and a person who works, uh, you know. Uh, works for social cause so it has it's a combination so i understand where you are coming from and what where it can really help out uh so thank you so much it was really wonderful and i just want to know what is your giveaway like you know what do you think what do you want to say from if i have missed some questions to ask you or you want to say something uh, can you just go ahead with that if do you really uh, want to say something about this particular subject more Oh, um, no, I, I just think that, um, you know, I think that in, in no matter if we're talking about uh, culture and international relations or creative economy, you know, I think that one takeaway is really, you know, open mindedness and diversity and thinking about the benefit for a broader range of people you know it is not about only about egoistic value it's not only about value creation for a company or direct art practice of an artist or only about country branding through culture for a government it's looking into the complexity and the relations and the, in the ways we can do things together um, that is really what's opening up a novelty and innovative practice. Um, you know, um, I think that um, what we all want is actually there, but it's maybe just not, people are not maybe just trying to achieve it in the ways that it should, because you're you too used to a certain system and way of thinking. So really this diversity, open-mindedness and collaboration that I think are so important for, from, for, for everything we talked about. Yeah, yeah. This, it mm. is absolutely wonderful. As, as you rightly said, uh, it is basically uh, the openness which we can and uh, to embrace cultures and, you know, ideas. Yeah. Uh, it's what we need to have have to do as a first step. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And um, thank you so much, Johanna, for uh, spending such precious time. And it was absolutely wonderful. Uh, uh, looking forward for more such talks on independently on different subjects. And thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bina. I'm so happy that I could uh, contribute and I'm happy to continue conversations. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. It was wonderful talking to uh, Johanna with regards to cultural diplomacy and uh, creative economy. They're very huge subjects uh, which we need to have more such talks uh, and uh, find out a method of implementation. You know, uh, because uh, when when we talk about culture, you know, we, that is something which we use uh, any in every phases of our life. You know, culture. But that has much deeper meaning when it comes to economy and uh, international relationships. Uh, we will learn more about it or we will know, we will have such more talks in future. Mm -hmm. So till that time, thank you so much for being there and uh, stay tuned for more interesting subjects. Thank you. <laughs>